Almost all of the animals we eat in this country are raised in confinement operations, indoor facilities that house thousands of chickens, cows, or hogs. Unlike the diversified farms that once were the norm, confinement operations tend to be highly specialized. Considering that humans have raised domesticated animals for thousands of years, this style of production is a new experiment. There are rising concerns about the impact of industrial farming on our health, the environment, local communities, and the welfare of the animals. However, there are still farmers who raise animals outdoors in diversified operations. Some would call them backward, but these farmers believe they're on the cutting edge of animal agriculture. They're not wanting to leave the shade. Can't say as I blame them. During the 1970s, it was a boom time in agriculture. We opened up the export markets, farm fence row to fence row, and there's gonna be prosperity for farmers forever. But then during the 1980s, then we went into a global recession, the export markets dried up, agriculture commodity prices dropped like a rock. Uh, farmers were caught with large loans at high interest rates, committing suicide when they lost the farm. And so I came to, to the realization, hey, this, this kind of agriculture that I had been taught, and that I had promoted, wasn't working. I began to realize that that kind of agriculture, which I call industrial agriculture now, not only was degrading and eroding the soil, but it's polluting the natural environment. And, and that was destroying the ability of the land to feed people of future generations. We're now producing eight billion animals each year for human consumption. Unfortunately, a lot of the true costs of doing business this way is uh, externalized to the environment. By that we mean that the costs are in the environment, uh, pollution of water and air, uh, degradation of soils, and general uh, contamination with the enormous amounts of animal waste that go along with industrial agriculture. We need to worry about the ability of uh, our farming system to produce food for my great-grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. How to do that is becoming more and more of a challenge. Of the 8 billion animals that uh, we raise and consume in the United States each year, uh, over 7 billion of them are poultry, mostly chickens. Typically, a poultry house has anywhere from 24,000 to 30,000 birds. Uh, they arrive as chicks and 45 to 48 days later, they're sent off to the slaughterhouse weighing about 5 to 5 and a half pounds. That's how our broilers are produced. Multinational corporations basically are controlling the production on farms through comprehensive production contracts with people that operate the large-scale confinement animal feeding operations or CAFOs. In, in many cases, the farmer that operates, or the producer, I wouldn't call him a farmer, but the producer that, that really operates a, a CAFO, in many cases, doesn't even own the animals. You're on my farm right now. We have uh, about 125 acres. You're in uh, one of my chicken houses that has 20,000 capacity chickens in this house, and the chickens are two weeks old. It's considered a medium-sized farm. Your big, big mega farms, I call them, the 10 and 12 house farms, they have 200, 250,000 capacity. Uh, those are the farms that have been built up in the last five to six years. I, I wouldn't own a, a farm that size. I have. You know, I, I think those people are very brave. You have to realize that it doesn't matter how good you are or at anything, the possibility does exist that you can get a disease. 
and the disease is in a 20,000 house versus the disease on 250,000, that's a huge loss for somebody. This is not your family farm behind me here. This is industrial sized agriculture and it needs to be regulated to preserve the natural resources that we have here in the state. The biggest problem with poultry on the eastern shore is the manure. There's more and more of these large scale industrial operations coming in. Each of these houses behind me can hold almost as many as 30,000 birds. And each chicken throughout its lifetime generates three pounds to three and a half pounds of manure. So now you've got a product that is full of nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, other heavy metals. It's being used as fertilizer on the fields to grow the corn and the soybean to feed the chickens. And the corn and soybeans use up a lot of the nitrogen, but the phosphorus is the big problem. This particular operation behind me is in such an environmentally sensitive area. To my right is Dividing Creek, which is a tributary of the Pocomoke River, and the Pocomoke feeds into the Chesapeake Bay. And literally within feet of such a very low, wet, sensitive area, we have this high area of um, poultry operation. So anything that's on the ground, um, the rain is going to carry it down into Dividing Creek. Well, why do we have to wait for a crisis to happen? You know, why can't everybody get together now, admit that we're all part of the problem? Don't leave it on the backs of the poultry growers to have to figure out what to do with it. Chickens are very popular food. A lot of the meat that you see actually goes to these fast food places and people consume it every single day. It's easier to produce, it's safe, it, it's economical, and it's cheap. Consumers delight. If people don't step back and say, look, the farmers are doing everything they can, it's more of a problem than just the farmers, then we're going to have a poultry industry that won't be on the shore in five years. The idea of raising that many animals with less than a square foot of living space until they go to processing, that's not good for the animals. You don't raise animals that way, and I don't approve of it, um, even though I used to do it. Kleckner Farms, uh, owned by Dwayne and Sheila Kleckner, uh, is an example that can be used for farmers um, locally. He went from being an industrial chicken producer and lost his contract and had to find something to do with his farm. And, you know, out of need, he started experimenting. Dwayne's a risk taker in, in this operation of his that he's doing now. But I, I think Dwayne's going to be successful. When I was a little kid, I remember my grandfather taking me out on the farm and uh, riding me around on this tractor. But he sold the farm in 1957. The only farming I had was uh, the backyard garden. Our farm is 12 acres. I sort of feel like I rescued it from corporate America where they were polluting all the time, um, raising chickens that I was embarrassed to eat. So right now I do it the way I'd like to, which is uh, no antibiotics, no hormones, no medications. I'm sort of raising chickens the way I thought my grandfather would with uh, minimal inputs. I probably work just as hard or maybe just a little bit harder now, but it, my quality of life is a little bit better because I'm working for myself instead of the man. But when I worked for them, they controlled my destiny. It was like I was a serf working for the king, whereas now, I am a duke working for myself. We tend to dismiss small farms today on the basis, well, they're not as productive. 
as are the larger farms. To me, a, a real farm is, is as much a way of life as it is a way of making a living. I would argue it's the smaller farms in general that are the real farms, not the big farms. I don't think there's anything that captures the attention of the urban dweller in America quite like a picture of a bucolic dairy farm. And sadly, those dairy farms are rapidly disappearing. A uh, herd size of 40 to 60 cows where the dairy farmer uh, had a name for every cow, where the cow spent most of the day out on pasture, came in twice a day for milking is being replaced by cows that spend their entire time standing on concrete inside a closed barn, never see a blade of green grass. Uh, their entire lives is spent eating specially prepared food that combines uh, uh, soy cake with uh, corn and with various other things with roughage that sometimes includes uh, uh, bits of plastic rather than anything digestible. I'm Kim Seeley and I live in north central Pennsylvania, Bradford County, and our farm goes back. It's a fourth generation farm now and it goes back. My grandfather uh, and my grandmother bought this farm in 1928. We will see a resurgence in small family farms, milking anywhere from 10 to 30 cows that sell their own cheeses, their own butters, and that they regionalize and take back their co-ops. We need to reinvent ourselves to go back to the 30s, 40s, and early 50s when we had multiple butcher shops, multiple creameries, where we can take raw materials a very short distance, have them process into something very storable and very healthy. It's going to come from grassroots people voting with their food dollars every day and just one day saying I'm sick and tired of where my money is going and to really put the dollars to the people that are making the difference. My youngest son, when he was only eight, one time we told him to go move the cows, and so he walked ahead of the cows and clapped his hands and opened the gates, and the cows went into the next pasture, and he locked them in successfully. And that seems like such a mundane, trivial little job, but yet it's feeding a herd of 70 cows as an eight-year-old. He came back and he said, I felt real power by doing that. <laughs> you know, it, In society, kids need to be a part of the system. Before we quit using chemicals, the birds didn't, weren't fertile and didn't reproduce and the birds didn't want to come to our farm. Well, if the birds don't return to the nest every year, then the, pretty soon the ecosystem collapses. And if our young people, being the birds, don't return to the nest and return to the farms and want to propagate the model, then the model's not good. But we're trying to breed a grass-fed dairy cow that never needs any grain, both for the economics of saving money of not having to buy grain and also for the health implications of the final product. We used to plant uh, grain and rotated our pasture land with our crop land, but we quit growing corn years ago, and so our pastures are blends of native species. And as we have just naturally let the pastures take care of themselves, we're seeing 50 to maybe 100 different species within the pastures that are all native species to this area. As our farm develops, our seed bank grows every year more and more. So uh, a lot of the weeds we've noticed that seem to be unpalatable to our mindset have turned out to be a very specific part of the cow's diet. Our oldest cow, for instance, is 17 years old. For a dairy cow, that's three times the state average. And she goes out and selectively will eat species, stinging nettles and plants that nobody would think an animal would eat. but. Seasonally, she knows what she wants, and you just stand back and observe the cows. They can teach us more than maybe we can teach them. If we could value food, good or bad, on its true merits, then farmers and, and 
young people can go back to the land and not have to farm thousands of acres and, and handle thousands of animals. Uh, sustainable agriculture is really uh, uh, ecologic agriculture. It tries to preserve biodiversity rather than uh, limit it. It uh, tries to uh, have the animal waste used to restore fertility to the soil rather than being dumped into a open cesspit and then having to be pumped out like cleaning out a septic tank. Animals will continue to be a part of a sustainable agriculture. I think they're a key part of a natural ecosystem in terms of recycling plant materials. You're on Holter Home Farms in Jefferson, Maryland. We're uh, just at the foothills of the Allegheny Mountain Range. And uh, we have been uh, farming this land since 1889, the Holter family. We had been a confinement dairy until uh, 1995. And then in 1996, we converted to a pasture-based dairy. It became certified organic in 2005 when the market opened up in, uh, in Maryland for organic milk. So we're, uh, we're now a seasonal, uh, no-grain, pasture-based dairy. We made that decision back in the fall of 97, uh, mainly because when you read the Bible, cows were not created to eat grain. Grain was created to feed people. And if he would have told me in 1996, when he told me, I want you to graze your cows, that by 2007 or 2008, you would be a, a seasonal pasture-based organic, no grain dairy for, with Jersey cows, it, I probably would have, my head would have exploded because I, I <laughs> There's no way! It can't happen! I don't work near as hard as I used to. I had all kinds of family time. I could see my children grow up and, and that was a real blessing. Um, when other young people hear that I'm going to be a farmer, um, they're, not, you know, they're, they're not sure about that because what they've grown up seeing is the conventional farmer, the confinement farmer. I guess what, what made me want to come back was when Dad did switch to organic in 2005. If we were a confinement farmer, I definitely would not have come back to the farm. Um, I can guarantee you that. My entire life, we have been strictly a dairy farm. When we transitioned to grazing uh, and had time to actually think again, rather than just chase our tail all the time, it kind of opened up many, many possibilities for us. We have uh, a tremendous amount of biology in our soils now, now that it's permanently vegetatively covered. And we have earthworms and dung beetles and, and all kinds of bugs and critters down there that are beyond counting but it, it really has, um, it, it's alive, the soil is alive, and that's something I never saw until we were pasturing. And so the smaller farms, if they are gonna stay in business, are gonna have to move toward a pasture-based uh, system. Uh, it would be my dream that all farms would move to a pasture base and we'd get rid of the big, big dairies because they're not a sustainable, uh, healthy uh, type of a system, something permanent that can uh, exist without government subsidies. There's a lot of people in all aspects of industrial agriculture today that, that don't really feel good about what they're doing. They really feel caught in this system and, and they don't know how to get out. And when people like myself or other people talk about sustainability and sustainable agriculture and organic and local foods, then the so-called agricultural establishment kind of marginalizes that. Most of the people in conventional agriculture, they've seen neighbor after neighbor after neighbor fail and they know sooner or later it's going to be them. population in the state of North Carolina. I'm Joe Corby. Uh, I'm a private pilot and I fly for the Noose River Keeper Foundation. Okay, we're flying over a hog farm in Duplin County. Probably population of 20,000 hogs here. A hog produces many times the, the uh, sewage that a human does. I mean, there's a factor of something in the order of maybe five 
times what a human produces or more and no uh, actual treatment plants to process the stuff. It's amazing. A lagoon is a waste pit and it's just a hole in the ground clay line where the hog waste is flushed out of the confinement buildings into this holding pond. There's some farm where have as many as 12 barns or confinement buildings itself. Uh, the waste that those animals are producing and it's being flushed out into a hole in the ground called a lagoon. And that same hog waste is being sprayed with big guns that propels this waste hundreds of feet across fields. There's been research to, to prove that these particular matters, uh, dust uh, from these CAFOs, can cause uh, some severe respiratory problems. I believe that this industry is polluting the water now. I wouldn't want to drink water uh, from a shallow well. The one thing that we've always wanted is clean water, clean air, and a clean environment. REACH is a nonprofit organization that's here in Duke County. We would like, you know, to be able to sit down with Smithfields, one of their representatives, and, and, and talk about some changes. You know, my concern or my question of that is, what kind of price tag do you put on people's lives and, you know, their health and well-being? Their top executives don't live in these communities, for one thing. Come have a picnic in my backyard and tell me if that smelled like bacon or whether that smelled like money or if it smelled like hog waste and urine, you know. The contract grower owns the building, but the industry owns the hogs, the feed, veterinarian supplies. Uh, so I begin to use the term that the contract grower is caught between a rock and a hard place. But at the same time, I didn't want to bash the, the industry. Still don't, because I still want them to continue to raise hogs. I believe if there was, if the, the laws or the rules uh, was a little bit more uh, stringent, or if it was tougher, uh, that many of these farmers would try to do the right thing. I believe they want to be good neighbors. Twenty-five years ago, there was a lot of hogs raised on the ground in, here in Duke County. And I believe that there's still some people that would like to go back to that. My name's Jeremiah Jones from Duke County. We're in actually a little community called Cedar Fort. Uh, I've been raising hogs for six years. I've been farming for 10. So I started fresh out of college. I went to state. <laughs> I was just turning 21 when I started farming. I ain't never been interested in contract farming. To me, all you do is you're owning the buildings and everybody else has to tell you what to do. And your contract reads, they're only, you're only guaranteed one flock, but you're signing your name to all that money for the barns, the goon, all the responsibility and the environmental problems. And all they're guaranteed to do is put you one flock or one bunch of hogs in there and then cut you off at any time. It's hard nowadays to have a bank, you know, lend you money on anything like this. They want a contract, you know, hog houses and stuff like that's what they look for. I enjoy having a little bit more control about everything I deal with. I got a buddy I went to college with. His family's got 15 hog houses. Uh, we'll go out to eat or something, but we don't go around each other's farms. People think a hog, they want it off the pasture, but a hog is just like us. If we eat salad, we're not going to gain any weight. You know, we can't live off salad. So you, you have to have them feed. I mean, the grass will, I mean, they'll eat, chew on it, whatnot, but I mean, they're really not getting a whole lot from it. So, us versus confinement, we're not allowed to use antibiotics, growth hormones, or animal byproducts. 
Um, we have to use basically all natural feeds. Uh, my name is David Whitman. Uh, we are standing in front of my boar slash gestation pen. Um, I have grown hogs down here for the most part since I was 14, and I'm 49 now, so you do the math. Um, hogs on the ground are, they're easier to, to keep them healthy. They get iron out of clay soil, which is good for them. Minerals out of the roots, of, you know, from trees and bushes and stuff. They're healthier. I almost never have to use antibiotics. When I do, I cannot sell to Whole Foods or to the, the pit restaurant. We don't get the volume that, that you get with the uh, indoor commercial uh, farms. In the hog houses, they're more confined. They're on cement. Cement is not a hog's natural desire to be on cement. They like dirt, they like mud. Um, it's just better for them. It's also better meat for us. I have many friends that grow hogs in the larger facilities. Um, I, I don't discuss growing hogs with them very much. Um, they do it their way and I do it mine. I was walking down the path one day and all of a sudden a lid came up a little bit and I was like, what was that? And it was a pig in there. Hey bud, what's up? <laughs> He's chowing down. First and foremost, I treat my uh, pigs in a humane way. We cannot use hog shockers. We can't kick them. We can't shove them. We cannot mistreat them physically. We cannot use uh, animal meat byproducts in their food. We cannot use steroids as, or any other growth hormones. We have to provide something they can graze on, forage on. We have to have certain size pens to provide so many square feet per pig. Hogs, in, in a lot of ways, are like people. In one way, um, they have personalities. In about six to six and a half months of age, these boys and girls is gonna be going to the slaughter market. You know, so they got such of a short life. So I try to, I do the best for them that I can while, while they're with us. It ain't all about the money. This is a hog haven. Not a worry in the world. <laughs> if I was, uh, you know, 25, 30 years old today and, and know what I know now, I, I would probably be a farmer. I would probably choose to to make my living in farming because I think the opportunities are there that weren't there whenever I was 25 or 30 years old. Some poultry. We do ducks, chickens, geese, turkey. I'm Eliza McLean. We are at a combination farm. I own Cane Creek Farm, which has uh, become nationally known. So I now own and run a large multi species uh, intensive grazing operation, and I raise four or five different species of poultry and four or five different species of. Uh, four-legged red meat animals for human consumption, which was actually a bit of a shift for me. I was actually a vegetarian for a while, but it just really became one of those things that um, I understood that boycotting that for me was not going to be the answer. I needed to be the change I wanted to see. I took a part-time job managing the swine herd at A&T State University here in Greensboro. 
they have a confinement barn and it was in absolutely wretched shape and the things that I saw in there were incredibly upsetting and really compelled me to do the alternative on the outside. Animals make us human, in the words of Temple Grandin. I mean, they really are a connection to the earth. We're never going to stop eating them. We're at the top of the food chain. The beginning of an educational shift that I think is crucially important right now. So this, this is my mission and my difference that I want to make. You're looking at a highly marbled, very fatty, dark red um, type of meat. This is a small animal, the shoulder chop. You don't see a chop like that ever in a supermarket. So this is a completely different paradigm and it needs to be cooked very little. The fat is melty at almost room temperature and just it has the most intense flavor because these animals eat grass and they eat barley. So the fat is where the flavor is and that's what people like about our stuff. Well the industrialization of the food system came about like the industrialization of agriculture. Agriculture, it was one farmer at a time deciding to grow something different in a different way, deciding they were going to market at a different place, buy different inputs. And so when we transform and change the food system of the future, it's going to be one consumer at a time, one person at a time, saying rather than buying this product, I'm going to buy this product because it's more consistent with my ethical, social, ecological values. <laughs> There's just a tremendous thrust to shift back to the old ways of doing things in North Carolina. I've seen such change in the seven years that I've been running this King Creek farm. It's going to work. The food system is probably going to be the first thing that it needs to change for the health benefits of all of us so that we become long livid again. Things are going to taste better, things are going to cost more, but we're going to eat less of them. And we're going to savor life a little bit more, you know?